Okay, we will get started. Uh, my name is Corey Diamond. I'm the Senior Director of Development and Alumni Relations here at Fletcher. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today for what uh, will be a great conversation. Um, I will turn it over to, uh, to the panelists uh, momentarily. Um, just as a reminder, when we get to the uh, Q&A portion, please enter your questions using the, the Q&A function on your screen and um, we will, uh, we will uh, present your questions to the panelists. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again very much. We also have another event tomorrow, um, which we will uh, post a link to in the chat. Hopefully you've seen the emails. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dean Rachel Kite. Well, Corey, thank you so much. And thank you to the whole alumni team for, for pulling together two really exciting events uh, today and tomorrow at our second virtual and 19th annual Talawa Symposium. So this time last year, when we took Talawa uh, online for the first time, um, I don't think we really realized uh, what the world would be going through over the coming months. Um, and we talked then about, uh, about the pandemic itself with David Nabarro, and we talked about the economic crisis and the opportunity that was coming on the back end uh, of, uh, the, of the pandemic and the opportunity to, to build back better or to, to cope with the economic impacts of, of the pandemic. So uh, here we are a, a year on and we're still, I think, struggling with how to, uh, as societies, as, uh, as political uh, entities, as uh, economies, to deal with threats in plain sight. Uh, that's what the pandemic was. Uh, the threat was fairly well documented. Um, but we didn't uh, respond uh, as an international community uh, or as individual communities uh, in a consistent and uh, consistently safe way. Uh, there are other threats in plain sight, including cyber security, uh, which is the subject very much uh, of our conversation today. This is a big issue for us at, at Fletcher across all of our disciplines, uh, not only to understand these threats, uh, but also to look at uh, how international cooperation can come together to, to manage and mitigate them. So today, uh, I'm really delighted to be able to be joined by two members of the fabulous Fletcher faculty, Josephine Wolfe and Chris Miller, uh, and they will discuss the cyber threat from Russia. Josephine joined Fletcher two years ago as Professor of Cybersecurity Policy. She's the author of You'll See This Message When It's Too Late, The Legal and Economic Aftermath of Cybersecurity Breaches. You'll have seen her writing in many uh, outlets, including Slate, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Atlantic. Her research interests include cybersecurity policy, the economics and information security and data breaches and liability. She's uh, much more, in, she is going to be really a big part of how we build out our approach to technology policy at Fletcher in the coming years. She's very well regarded by students and voted uh, by the class of 2020 uh, as the um, award winner for the, 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 from the students for the, uh, the, the best uh, teacher for the, for the year. And as a result, gave a compelling speech at commencement uh, at this time last year. And Josephine is joined then by Chris Miller. Chris is a professor of international history at Fletcher. He's co-director of our Russia and Eurasia program. He's the author of Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia, and the Struggle to Save the Soviet Economy. He's a frequent contributor to the Times, New York Times, and Foreign Policy magazine, and his research interests are Russian history, politics, economics and foreign policy, Cold War history, and US diplomatic history. Although he's going to be stretching out in his new book into uh, new areas uh, as well. Much to be looking forward to there, and we hope to hear more about that in the next year. Chris has taught a popular course on US-Russian relations that is taught with students uh, in Moscow and at Fletcher at the same time because of our close relationship with the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, known better to most of you as Mungimo. Fletcher and Mungimo students uh, study faith, uh, side by side, and of course this has been interesting in a year when everybody is uh, studying side by side in Zoom boxes. So we couldn't have two better people to explore where we are at a time of uh, cyber breaches, at a time when with a new administration in the US, surely the relationship with Russia and with President Putin must be one of the most complex and complicated and perhaps dangerous relationships that need to be managed by Tony Blinken and the team.
So with all of that, uh, I'm going to hand over straight away to Josephine. Please put your questions uh, in the Q&A and we will come to them after we've listened to both of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past 15 years from the cybersecurity lens, what Russia has been up to, what some of the sort of landmark incidents are, taking us up through today, thinking a little bit about the colonial pipeline, the JBS ransomware attacks that are very much still in the news today, and trying to put a little bit into perspective how we think about Russia as a power in cyberspace as compared to some of the other powers. When we think about Russia in the context of US, China, Iran, North Korea, what are some of the characteristics of their offensive cyberspace operations, where they seem to be going, what they seem to be interested in. And when you start telling the history of sort of cyber conflict, almost always where you start is actually with Russia in 2007, when there's a fairly large scale distributed denial of service attack directed at the country of Estonia. And it's right after Estonia has moved a Soviet war monument out of the capital, and there are some tensions between Estonia and Russia. Because Chris is here, I'm gonna let him do sort of all of the real history and geopolitical context. But there's an understanding even among people like me that sort of Russia may have some geopolitical motivation at the time, to launch this cyber attack. And it's really unlike anything anybody's ever seen in 2007 and that it's an entire country's infrastructure targeted with really high volume bombardment of packets, which is to say, just saying, sending so much information at the Estonian networks that they all go down. The newspapers go down, the government websites go down, the banks go down. It essentially takes the entire country offline for a period of time. And there's a sense in which Estonia certainly feels this is the first act of cyber war we've ever seen. It sparks a lot of reaction from NATO, which starts working on the Tallinn Manual of International Law as applied to cyberspace. It prompts a NATO review of how they're going to respond to cyber attacks. It generates a lot of sort of questions around how do we perform attribution, which is something we're much less good at in 2007 than we are now. Estonia points pretty quickly to Russia and says, we think this came from them. Other governments are much slower to get to that point. There's a lot of uncertainty around, was this actually being directed by the Russian government as opposed to just sort of individuals based in Russia? And then you have almost a decade after that, from 2007 to about 2016, when Russia is really not being viewed as the main threat by the United States, by Western Europe and cyberspace. And there's a pretty strong shift towards looking at China and thinking about sort of the economic espionage attacks that are coming out of the Chinese military and a lot of the US diplomatic efforts and strategies for dealing with cyber attacks emerge around that focus on China. So we get sort of the first set of indictments coming out of the United States. You start to see a lot of the cyber norm development efforts in international organizations coalescing with the idea that the US and China are sort of the two main powers here and need to be leading these efforts, which is a complicated and largely unsuccessful effort in a lot of ways. But one of the things that's happening in that time period is that Russia is denouncing a lot of those norms processes is saying this is being led by the United States. We don't wanna be part of this. We don't think that these forums are sort of doing a good job or doing a, a fair job of thinking about who's responsible for what when it comes to cybersecurity. And there's also starting around 2013, 2014, a wave of the early ransomware. So one of the, the first sort of successful strains of ransomware called CryptoLocker is being distributed. It's fairly small compared to what we see now, but at the time starts to look like a somewhat scary thing and a, a growing threat. And a lot of that is being traced back to Russian organized cybercrime, all of the botnets that distribute these ransomware programs, that is to say the compromised computers that are sending out phishing emails with the malware attached to them seem to be operated by people in Russia. Some of those are people that United States law enforcement is able to identify, um, file charges against, and there's really no cooperation from the Russian government there. There's no willingness to work with Europol. There's no willingness to work with the United States. Um, and so you get sort of the development of this idea in 2014 or so that Russia is willing to harbor cyber criminals, is willing to allow certain kinds of financially motivated cyber crime to occur within its borders, but not necessarily a sense that the Russian government itself is a major player in this space, is developing a lot of capabilities. And that really shifts 
in the 2016-2017 period. And there are two things that happened there. One is the interference in the 2016 election, the breaches of the Clinton campaign networks, the DCCC networks, um, the misinformation campaigns on social media, which get an, a lot of attention in the United States. And the other and sort of much more technologically sophisticated thing that happens comes in the summer of 2017, which is the NotPetya attack that's directed at Ukraine. It's focused specifically on tax preparation software that's used by Ukrainian businesses, but spreads much more widely than that, affects an enormous number of businesses across Europe and in some other continents as well, causes billions and billions of dollars of damage and disruption to companies' operations, and really sort of serves as a little bit of a wake-up call to a lot of places that have been considering China the main focus of a lot of their efforts to develop norms or to name and shame for cyber attacks, and announces the technical sophistication of what Russia has built up over the past decade since the attacks on Estonia, how much sort of more novel and sophisticated their ability to develop malware has become, how extensive their distribution networks for that malware has become, and also how little concern they have with sort of some of the norms that have been begun to be floated. So little concern about collateral damage and the question of what's going to happen outside their particular targets, little concern about disruption and sort of hitting civilian targets as something that's been sort of trying to be accepted as a little bit of a norm in the international community um, and causes so much damage that it actually prompts the United States and several of its allies, the UK, Australia, France, to do the first coordinated attribution of a cyber attack ever, right? So all of these governments announced within about a one week span, this was the Russian government, this was the Russian government. And it's both sort of totally symbolic and meaningless in the sense that, you know, so what? And on the other hand, I think a little bit of an example of these countries that thought they had sort of started to set in motion a process that was going to work in terms of naming and shaming perpetrators with Chinese cyber espionage, realizing that Russia doesn't care very much, that none of these sort of uh, diplomatic tools that they've come up with are going to be very meaningful. And we sort of come to the most recent slate of cyber attacks that have been attributed to Russia in 2020, 2021, that I just wanna say a word about, though you've probably many of you read about them recently. One is the Solar Winds Compromise, which is interesting because it's the first really widespread covert cyber operation that we've seen out of Russia. So one of the things that Estonia, uh, the distributed denial of service attacks there and not Petya have in common is they're totally uninterested in flying under the radar. They're cyber attacks that are meant to get people's attention and shut down operations and make everybody sit up and take notice. Totally opposite of what we see out of China in the early 2010s, which are these very covert long-term cyber espionage campaigns. Solar Winds is essentially a cyber espionage campaign, but it's a much broader sort of much further upstream campaign in that it infects a piece of software that's being used by thousands of different companies and government organizations across mostly the United States, and then uses that as a platform to infiltrate all of those systems, collect information across an enormous range of organizations, and does so for many, many months, which is not something that we're used to at that point coming out of Russia, the idea that they can plan and execute cyber operations that stay under the radar for that long and that are primarily focused on espionage rather than disruption or financial theft. And then most recently, we've seen these two really high profile ransomware attacks, one directed at the Colonial Pipeline, one directed at the JBS uh, meat processing plants in the United States, where you see, we think, Russian cyber criminal organizations, not the Russian government itself, launching incredibly disruptive attacks that speak to sort of the continuation of that idea that Russia is willing to harbor cyber criminals, is even in some cases willing to work with them to collect intelligence from the systems that they're compromising for their own financial purposes. And that that, uh, that unwillingness to engage in the norms development process that dates back to 2010, 2011, continues to be a huge hindrance to actually making any progress in that space to actually being able to put a dent in the ransomware threat or think about how we disentangle cyber crime from political cyber operations because the two seem to be so intertwined, particularly in the Russian context. 
So if we're thinking about sort of where Russia falls on the various axes of other threat actors in cyberspace, I think as compared to the US and China, there's much more interdependence or intermingling of the financially motivated cyber criminal organizations with the government itself. It's much harder to draw distinctions and say, let's set some norms for cyber crime, let's set some norms for cyber espionage, let's set some norms for cyber conflict, because all of those seem to be combined much more in much more complicated ways that make it hard to distinguish and set different norms for them. There's very little concern for collateral damage. There's very little concern around the idea of sort of, we should try to scope the harm that's uh, caused by these types of attacks. So when we compare some of these Russian cyber attacks to things like Stuxnet, uh, the worm that was developed by the United States and Israel to target Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities, that's a piece of malware that's really explicitly designed to go in and affect only one particular type of software on one particular type of computer that was known to be used in those plants. And the malware that's coming out of Russia, things like NotPetya, things like the um, virus that's put into the solar wind software are much more widespread. There's much less targeting. And that really detracts from the idea that a lot of people have had about cyberspace operations that the benefit of cyber attacks is supposed to be we can target them really narrowly. Instead of these sort of messy, violent kinetic attacks, you can just decide, okay, I wanna disable this particular kind of machinery or this particular kind of organization. And that has not been sort of characteristic of the cyber attacks coming out of Russia. So there's this very strong willingness to harbor cyber criminals, even to go after the law enforcement officials in the country who do engage in international cooperation, which has really disincentivized anybody in Russia from wanting to work with international law enforcement groups. And perhaps most of all, a real willingness to experiment with new models of cyber attacks to go beyond sort of the, the constraints and the borders of what other countries have done or even what Russia itself has done in the past and do things that the United States at least has said very explicitly it may have the capabilities to do, but is worried about setting precedents for other countries and other places to try. Russia seems very unconstrained by that fear, very unconstrained by this idea that if they launch some of these types of attacks, those may be used against them, those may set a dangerous precedent. And interestingly, so far at least, that's actually helped, right? There aren't other countries doing things like this back to Russia. All of the responses have been fairly diplomatic, um, fairly still focused on that naming and shaming approach with a little bit of sort of sanctions tied in. And one of the things that I think is really interesting to see going forward is if all of those responses continue to have as little impact as they seem to, will other countries start to play a little bit more by Russia's rule book and use some of these same models? Or will that continue to be seen as sort of an outlier in this space? So really, thank you so much for sort of whizzing us through 15 years right up to the, the, current, uh, the current state of affairs and the sort of intensification of uh, AR awareness of what's going on and, uh, and uh, how the international community is working to, to respond to it, but also then um, perhaps uh, what this means for how we think about uh, policy in this area going forward. So let's get a, let's get a perspective from, from, from Chris. Uh, uh, Russia, that's your, that's where you spend most of, that's where your, uh, all your emotional energy is, right? Uh, understanding uh, this country and its relationships. So take it away. Great. Well, well, thank you, Rachel, for the invitation to, to join today. I, I thought what I could try to do is, is present how I think the Russian government conceptualizes this issue um, and, and sort of put the Russian way of thinking onto a number of the uh, different actions that uh, Josephine described and, and, and illustrate how official Moscow um, looks at cyberspace as a domain of competition, both political competition and also um, military competition. I think when you talk to Russian cyber experts and the Russian government's official documents um, mostly back this up, uh, the Russian foreign policy elite divides uh, cyber into three distinct categories. Uh, which to a certain extent map on to the way that uh, American and, and European uh, leaders think about cyber, but there are important differences uh, too. The, the first category is espionage, uh, and most Russian commentators have put the solar winds attack into the espionage category. There's been some 
debate among American analysts as to whether uh, the the pervasiveness uh, of of attack uh, puts it in a different category than quote unquote normal espionage. We can we can debate that. Um, but espionage in, in in the Russian definition is defined as primarily focusing on gathering information, which is sort of fits with the, the, the historical definition of espionage. I think more interesting for our purposes are the second two categories. And, and here's where you see some really substantial uh, differences with how things have traditionally been conceptualized in the United States and um, in European countries as well. Uh, in Russian official thinking, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a category of analysis called the information sphere uh, and a, a focus of government policy, which the Russian government calls information security which involves uh, cyber as a tactic and cyber as a domain in which information security can be guaranteed. Uh, but there's also other ways that information security can be contested or guaranteed, including televisions and newspapers and uh, other means of controlling debate. Uh, and in, in the Russian uh, view, information security is how the government uh, sets boundaries on its political and information space, how it controls what ideas are present uh, in the public sphere, how it polices the entry of uh, foreign ideas into its own public sphere. And in, in Russian thinking, this isn't only a question of cyber. You can have uh, foreign ideas introduced via TV channels, via radio, via uh, foreign books, via foreign social media. So cyber is, is just uh, one way in which ideas can enter the information space. And traditionally, Russia has been as concerned with other methods of uh, foreign penetration of the Russian information space as it has with uh, internet-based methods. Although this is beginning uh, to change. But the Russian government over the past 20 years focused more on television uh, than it did on, on, on cyberspace. And only in the past couple of years, I would argue that Russia's really prioritized uh, domesticating uh, its social media networks fully and controlling uh, the, the information space on Russian social media in a way that it had previously uh, done with television. Uh, and in the Russian view, uh, the, the Russian information space has been penetrated by Western and above all U.S. information uh, for a long time in a way that has not been under sufficient control of the Russian government. Uh, and the Russian government realizes that it struggles to control its own information space, uh, given the dominance of uh, U.S. and English language news outlets and setting the agenda uh, globally. And for the Russian government, this is a, a deeply concerning reality. Uh, and the Russian government's response has in part been to try to build higher walls to prevent foreign information from seeping in. But there's also been an offensive aspect to this as well, which is most visible uh, in the interference in the 2016 presidential election. In the Russian telling, what happened in 2016 was Russia using the tools that were available to the Kremlin to intervene in America's information space in a way that Russians believe uh, that the United States had been interfering in the Russian information space for much of the previous uh, several decades. And the Russian government's official view is that information's, uh, the information space is, uh, has a profound influence on the political process. And so if you can shape the information space, then you can shape uh, the political process. The Russians see this worrying when it's directed at them, but they see it as an opportunity when it's directed externally. And so uh, a number of the information operations that we've seen the Russian government adopt in a variety of countries over the past couple of years are an attempt to turn what the Russians saw as a weakness uh, against their adversaries uh, and, and use some of the methods that they perceived as being used against them in the 1990s and 2000s uh, against countries. And the goal of the Russian government, uh, certainly they said this in their statements, and I think there's a, a fair amount of truth behind this. The goal is to illustrate that all countries are vulnerable to foreign interference in their information space. And therefore, uh, that the great powers, at least, and potentially all of the countries uh, in, in, in broader Europe, including uh, in all the countries of NATO, ought to negotiate a, a set of principles that would govern uh, interference in each other's information space. Uh, the Russian government proposed this formally to President Trump at uh, the meeting in Helsinki uh, for a whole variety of reasons that didn't go anywhere, uh, in part because Western societies struggle to uh, struggle to, 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 to sign on to control the information space style principles, given the, uh, the, the problematic notions that that involves in terms of governing freedom of speech. But nevertheless, this is the Russian government's strategy. They want a, a mutual non-interference pact in each other's information space. And so the Russian government sees this not primarily as a, a cyber question, but rather as an information uh, security question.
And so from the Kremlin's perspective, it's actually not helpful to conceptualize this in terms of who's hacking whom. That's not really the important part from the Kremlin's perspective. The important part is who is inserting information into the other's information space in order to influence uh, the political process. And that's a, an understanding that uh, doesn't match on to historically with how the U.S. and other Western governments have thought about this issue. And it's been, I think, the cause of a series of uh, misunderstanding between uh, the, the two sides for some time. And then thirdly, there's a, a type of cyber attack that I think uh, fits in a broader category of low-grade political warfare, often uh, casually referred to as hybrid warfare, although I think that term is, is, is not all that helpful. But there's been a whole series of um, Russian efforts, often by the Russian intelligence services, security services over the past couple of years that have intervened in, uh, in, in, in countries in Europe and the United States um, uh, in, in a variety of disruptive waves that are designed to raise the cost of countries opposing uh, Russian government's policies. And here, I think you see actually a lot of similarities between incidents in the cyber, in the cyber domain and incidents in the non-cyber domain that actually uh, are structured in similar ways. So uh, Josephine, for example, mentioned uh, the ways in which uh, Russian cyber attacks like NotPetya were uh, disruptive far beyond their specific targets and did a lot of collateral damage. I think you can identify uh, similar um, traits in, in Russian uh, attacks outside of the cyber sphere. So I would, for example, point to Russian assassinations that have taken place uh, in Europe, like the attempted assassination of Sergei Skripal in the UK. I had collateral damage of killing the wrong person. They tried to kill Skripal, they failed, and instead they killed somebody else with a chemical weapon. Uh, and so in some ways, this is an attack that's rather similar to uh, not petty, an attack that's indiscriminate, uh, that uses a weapon that is not designed to be particularly well targeted uh, and that has a very high risk of, of collateral damage. Uh, and, and so here too, I think it's, it's useful to both look at it in the context of uh, the, the cyber uh, domain, but also to see it as, as part of a broader uh, Russian tactic of raising the temperature of political competition between Russia uh, and the West as a means of sending a message to the West that Russia is willing to bear a whole lot of risk in this competition more risk generally than Western countries are willing to bear. And this has been, I think, an effective Russian tactic over the past couple of years, always threatening to go one step further uh, than Western governments are willing to go. Uh, the West always look, is looking for off-ramps for confrontation, and Russia's always been willing to turn up the temperature a bit further uh, to a point where Western leaders decide it's just too risky to escalate uh, in response. And so as as Josephine alluded to in, in the, the cyber sphere, I think you see this in other spheres as well. Uh, there's a perception in Russia that uh, Western countries don't have uh, hard red lines they're willing to defend, and they're much more interested in uh, responding via diplomatic uh, tactics rather than something that would um, be more costly uh, to Russia. And I think the Russian government has shown that uh, reputational costs don't matter all that much to it. Uh, and so efforts to punish it by, by increasing reputational costs aren't likely uh, to be very effective. And I think this is something that's true in, uh, in the cyber sphere, but it's true much more broadly. All of the efforts to name and shame uh, Russian assassins across Europe also hasn't uh, led to any de decrease in assassinations and arguably the opposite. Um, so, so here too, I think there's uh, an important way in which we need to see Russian cyber operations as cyber operations, but also an important way to see them as part of the broader repertoire of uh, Russian uh, relations with uh, the West and Russian tactics of, of political warfare and low-grade uh, military operations uh, that have been ongoing for some time and escalating in many ways uh, for the past uh, couple of years. So I'll, I'll pause there, Rachel, but would, would welcome any questions that you have or any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I've got all kinds of questions uh, in, in particular about, you know, looking into the crystal ball in the future and where, where does this, uh, where does this relationship, uh, where does the relationship between the West and Russia go and then what, what can we expect perhaps to see? But I'm going to hold on to that. Maybe we come to that sort of future orientation uh, well into the questions. We're starting to get Q&A. And one of the things you said, Chris, was sort of uh, when you were talking about the second sort of basket of, of threats you talking about the russian attitude to this as being about information control uh, and that we have a question from tatiana andrasov or a comment anyway i mean is there anything to can we think about cyber attacks and cyber uh, 
tension or war, uh, info wars, does does thinking about arms control and the the the, the sort of mindset between arm, of arms control and the, the setting up of the negotiations in arms control does is there anything about that which is useful to apply to this particular situation and um, both maybe to Chris and then Josephine? Well, I think certainly in in the Russian thinking, there's a parallel, uh, and, and the parallel goes as follows: the key to the creation of the first arms control regimes in the 1970s was a sense of mutual vulnerability. Uh, one side wasn't going to unilaterally disarm. It was only when both sides felt equally at risk of uh, nuclear annihilation that they agreed to begin limiting the nuclear forces. And I think Russia's strategy over the past couple of years, most notably in 2016, but more broadly, has been to increase this sense of mutual vulnerability in the West. Russian leaders have felt vulnerable for a long time. Uh, Western leaders have, have felt less vulnerable, and that's, that's been changing recently. Um, so in that sense, I think there, there certainly is an analogy that one could draw uh, to the 1970s. I think the question that's still open is whether there, are, um, whether there are lessons from what worked in the 1970s that one could or whether we want to apply uh, for thinking about um, cyber and the information sphere today. I think one could argue uh, much more easily that there are lessons to be learned for agreements about not targeting critical infrastructure, which is the place where the Biden administration and the, and the Kremlin right now are actually undertaking negotiations. And I think we might see an announcement of some sort out of the summit in Geneva uh, of a series of conversations on that particular topic. So not targeting power plants or uh, other types of infrastructure that's, that's deemed to be critical. I think much more difficult is this uh, concept of arms control around the information space. Uh, the, a number of, of Russians who advise the, the government have floated ideas along these lines. Um, in, in the West, I think there are two issues. One is that um, a lot of the things that Russia would be very comfortable with to control the information space conflict uh, with our views of, of what's acceptable given freedom of speech. Uh, and so that's, that's a core issue. A second issue is whether the types of things that most worry Russia are things that we can realistically regulate. One of the key challenges that Russia faces is that it uh, often sees American hands or the CIA's hands or MI6's hand behind fundamentally domestic forces in Russian politics. And insofar as uh, Russia blames uh, the CIA for its domestic political movements, uh, it's going to be hard for, for the U.S. to promise uh, not, to, not to be meddling in Russian politics if, in fact, uh, the Kremlin's identifying phantoms that, that aren't fundamentally driven by Western intelligence agencies. And so that, that question of attribution, I think, is, is fundamentally important. And it's, it's not only an issue in terms of attributing who did this cyber attack, but also what's driving political discontent in, in different countries. Josephine, do you have anything to add to that? I think I would say one of the things that worries me, and there's, there's a lot of talk in my world about sort of cyber deterrence and how do we use the lessons from the Cold War to, to guide us forward on this. And I think there are a couple things that I feel are really intractable. One is the question of what disarmament looks like, sort of how you know that it's actually happening, how you verify it, what that would even mean. Um, and so I think that's really hard and I don't have great answers to it. And I think the other piece of this that, that Chris talked a little bit about is that it's not at all clear that Russia feels very vulnerable to the United States or anybody else right now in this domain. It's not, it's not clear that the United States ever would target uh, energy sector or sort of any of those critical infrastructure elements that they're trying to pressure other countries not to target. And so I'm not sure, I think there was a window when Russia felt vulnerable when they felt that the United States had stronger cyber capabilities and might be able to do real damage. And I worry a little bit that we've missed that window for negotiation and that now Russia feels pretty strongly it has the upper hand. So may, maybe building off that point, um, there's a, a question or a question or comment from Leroy uh, Terlange saying a colleague used to work with the FBI, previously told me that in the early 2000s, Russia and the U.S. cooperated pretty extensively. Um, you know, does that track with what you've seen and, and what's the state of that cooperation now? And I suppose when I think about these things, the, you, the enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? So if there were, a, if, there were if, if we have the United States, we have Russia, and then there was somebody else uh, with a cyber capability and, and both felt under attack, would that promote more cooperation? But, but what's the state of cooperation? today is it is it all moribund now or 
Um, and wh when did that ease away, perhaps? Josephine, maybe then, Chris. So I, I do agree that sort of you look at the early 2000s, you don't get extensive cooperation, but you see pretty healthy back and forth around issues of cybercrime between US and Russia. Um, I think a couple of things change. I think both governments get much more confident in their own ability to use these tools. And so there's a period when sort of all governments really feel that they're behind the curve for criminals who have developed cyber capabilities and are working together because they, they see that common goal in trying to figure out how to catch criminals and people who are breaking into their own networks. Um, I think that for both the US and Russia by 2010, 2012, that's no longer the case. Both governments feel they've sort of got enough of a handle on the technology that they're, they're not being constantly outwitted by criminals in their own countries. Um, and so there's perhaps some, some less interest in cooperating because of that. And I think the other thing that happens is that there's a crackdown within Russia, and Chris may know more about this than I do, on some of the people in Russian law enforcement who have been working with British and American law enforcement officers to catch cyber criminals. Two of them are actually uh, arrested and put on trial. And that, I think, sends a very strong message to people within Russia that this is not the kind of activity that's going to be looked kindly on, that people are getting in very serious trouble for this. And therefore, sort of, there's, there's a pretty immediate and complete shutdown of all of the cooperation that's been happening up to that point. Chris? I, there's a parallel process that happens alongside these, these cyber-specific dynamics with just the general deterioration of Russia's relations with the West, which were relatively good in the early 2000s. And um, by the end of the decade, uh, we're on a, a pretty uh, severe downward slope and, and have been kind of uh, deteriorating ever since. Um, and so I, I think there was a sense in which cyber wasn't seen primarily as a domain of competition in the 2000s, whereas certainly after 2007, that had changed. Um, and since then, we've seen, I would argue, pretty steady escalation year after year in, in, in the, the sense in which cyber is a more and more and more important area of competition between the two powers. And it's, it's seen as such both in, in Washington and in Moscow. So I think today the, there's hardly any, there's some cooperation, but, but really it's 95% it's, it's competition, um, both in, in, in Washington and in Moscow. So we've got a bunch of questions about, well, okay, what's the end game? If, if Russia feels um, uh, pretty uh, confident or pretty secure, uh, what what should what should be the the, the response then of, of the West? And I think there's also some questions about uh, if there are concerns about um, uh, information technology and the relationship with China. You know, is there what what is what's the EU US uh, game look like as well? So questions around the um, confidence of Russia and then how the West would respond to that. Questions about the triangulation with the EU and the US. And then I, I think there's some very specific questions which we'll come on to about uh, some of the policy evolution and the, infra the sort of institutional evolution of um, cyber in the US. But uh, maybe to you, Chris, and then we can, uh, Josephine, talk about how, how the US policy and institutional response looks like at the moment. Well, I guess looking at US-Russian relations in the aggregate, uh, I think one of the, the fundamental problems is that uh, both uh, the U.S. and Russia have different assessments as to which power is a rising power and which power is a declining power. So Russians are convinced that the U.S. is, uh, is, is declining and has been for some time, uh, that China is rising, which will harm the U.S. more than it will harm Russia. And so Russia's bargaining position will get better and better as time passes. And so if you think your bargaining position is going to get better, you don't cut a deal now, you wait five years and you get a better deal then in, in the U.S., the view is the the polar opposite: is that Russia is the declining power, uh, its population is declining. It's not actually true, but most Americans think that uh, its economy has been stagnant for a long time, um, and and you know Putin is leading a sort of aging uh, leadership that 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 can't uh, that can't find any sort of new paths for Russia. And there's some truth to that. Uh, and as a result, um, from the Obama administration. Uh, for the present, most U.S. leaders have insisted that Russia is a defining power, and so the U.S. simply needs to wait, and Putin will die, or the country will implode, or something will, uh, will, will make it easier for the U.S. to bargain with Russia in the future. And so because both countries think that their bargaining position will be better in the future, everyone's in wait-and-see mode. Uh, 
uh, waiting to the other side uh, to, to give up in, in the political competition. And so what that means is that uh, both countries think it's in their interest to just pursue current policies going forward. So Russia is going to pursue its existing policies, which it sees as accelerating uh, the weakening of the United States and grabbing additional rifts into the alliance between the U.S. and, and key European countries. Uh, and one could argue that Russia's uh, been somewhat effective in this in, in recent years. Um, and from the U.S. perspective, the containment of Russia, which uh, the Obama administration put in place, is not uh, working immediately, but containment is never intended to work immediately. Uh, and, and so the architects of that policy uh, under the Obama administration argue that all you need to do is give it a bit more time uh, and, and it will pay off. And, and that could be true. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. But the, the result of that is, is that from both sides, there's a, a pretty strong belief that pursuing and even intensifying existing policies is the right strategy. Uh, and from the different starting points, you can see why people think that. Uh, but the result of that is that you have an increase in competition over time um, because each side has been repeatedly doubling down on, on its strategy. And so I think that the key question at, at the highest level is, what would it take for one side or the other to change its assessment about whether it's a rising or declining power? Uh, thus far, it doesn't seem like either side is ready to do so soon. Um, perhaps the Biden administration will surprise us, but the, the initial appointments don't make me think that, that it will. Uh, and so in that context, I think it's hard to be optimistic about the scope for, for a reduction in competition in, in the short term, simply because uh, it, it seems baked into to both sides' fundamental strategies that their their current tactics are working. So, Josephine, maybe you could. Uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, global the global engagement center and cyber command, and what what that's been able to do for the the way in which the U.S. Uh, approaches this relationship and these issues. Maybe you could reflect on that. And then I think for both of you, there's a summit coming up. I think fairly soon. What could be done in that summit? So I think the short answer to, to what has global engagement and cyber command gotten us is basically nothing, right? I mean, the, the sort of progress on any kind of significant international cooperation or norm setting has been minimal anywhere, not just between the US and Russia. I think there are sort of two, not necessarily mutually exclusive ideas that have, have gained traction in the cybersecurity community about what the right way to respond to Russian aggression in this domain is. One is that you sort of focus domestically on locking down all the critical infrastructure. And this is somewhat in line with what we've seen out of the Biden administration in the past week or two, right? You focus on setting security standards, you ramp up all of the technical protections, you really try to make sure that all of the old legacy infrastructure is as protected as offline as it possibly can be and focus on defense. And the other strategy, which gained a lot of traction during the Trump administration, at least sort of in principle, though it's not clear how much they acted on it, is really a sort of offensive one to say, look, the only thing that's going to get Russia's attention here, though under the Trump administration, it's not clear it was particularly directed at Russia, is if we start doing offensive cyber operations the way that other countries are doing it. So there's this philosophy that comes out of the Department of Defense in 2017, which is called persistent engagement. And it's basically the idea we're going to be in adversaries networks at all times as soon as there's any kind of manipulation or sabotage or other type of attack, we're going to be right in there doing the same thing to them. And there are a lot of people who spent a lot of time putting together that strategy. And one of the things that's been interesting to watch is that nobody agrees on whether or not it's worked, right? There are people who say, you know, persistent engagement has been a tremendous success and we've done all of these incredible operations. And that's why there have been so few cyber attacks. And there are people who say, look at all the cyber attacks. What are you talking about? It's been a disaster. And I'll say, you know, I personally am a little bit of a coward. So I tend to come down more on the, we should really be hardening our own defenses side of thinking about these two approaches. But I do think that sort of coming back to Chris's idea about who's the rising power, who's the declining power, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that in cyberspace, Russia's the rising power and the US is the declining power. And so there is some, some momentum on the side of if we, if we really want to sort of bring Russia to the table on this, maybe it's time to burn through a few zero day vulnerabilities. Maybe it's time to sort of go after one of their pipelines or some of their critical infrastructure. I am pretty skeptical based on who's in the administration right now that that's imminent. 
but I think it's certainly something people talk about a lot in the U.S. So there you are, go after a pipeline. Uh, so Biden and Putin will meet in the next uh, few uh, days, right? Um, is, how does this get discussed at the summit and what, what, would, what would you hope for from, uh, from a summit? Uh, they just look into each other's eyes and they understand whether or not either one's got a soul, I think was the latest quote. Chris? I think that's that's probably a, a big chunk of what we're going to get out of the summit is, is them looking into each other's eyes. Uh, you know, in terms of actual substance, I'm sure we'll get a communique that talks about COVID and talks about climate. Um, I don't know if there'll be actually a lot of substance to either of those points. Um, I think the there's two interesting uh, issues that might come out of the summit. One is a, a cyber conversation that I think if it, if it does materialize, we'll focus on critical infrastructure. And the question is, well, what does that actually look like if you start a, a, a conversation on uh, critical infrastructure? Is it, is it a do not hack deal? Well, that probably is, is not realistic. Um, and if it's not that, then, then what is it? Is it a discussion of are certain things off limits or uh, understanding of capabilities? I think that's, a, a, that's yet to be determined what is the end point of the conversation that begins on, on critical infrastructure. Uh, but I, I think there's definitely interest in, in both Moscow and Washington in starting that conversation, even if nobody knows where it will end up. And then the second thing, uh, which I think we're also likely to see some sort of announcement on, is, is nuclear arms control, um, which is which is an important issue in its own right, but also has some interesting uh, interlinkages with, with the cybersphere, um, both because it's, I think, now pretty clear that uh, when you think of strategic stability writ large, uh, countries like Russia and the United States are, are now thinking of cyber as a really fundamental vulnerability in a way that um, nuclear weapons have been seen as a fundamental vulnerability for some time. Not, not that cyber is going to kill as many people as a nuclear bomb could, but um, that it does pose some, some really critical um, threats to, to one's potential ability to retaliate militarily. Uh, and the second thing which has also been discussed is whether cyber capabilities might interfere with uh, either country's uh, launch capabilities. And I think right now the jury is, is still out on, on how real this threat is, but you could certainly imagine that both sides would be quite concerned about the other's ability to use potentially a cyber attack to uh, in some way imperil either their command and control or their surveillance necessary to uh, see whether the other side has launched a nuclear attack first. So there are some, I think, interesting questions to be asked about the intersection of, of cyber and traditional uh, nuclear questions, although I think here too we're less likely to see substantive announcements at the summits rather than just conversations being started. And certainly in the nuclear sphere, the people on both sides who have negotiated arms control deals in the past are most comfortable when it comes to counting numbers of warheads and counting delivery systems. Uh, we know how to have those negotiations. They've been done many times in the past. It's much more complicated and requires a new set of participants in the conversation to bring um, the, the, the cyber related questions in, into that uh, discussion. So just just following on uh, on sort of the as you as you talk about the vul potential vulnerabilities to tr more traditional um, uh, arms and security, one of the questions is around you know rogue actors, right? Um, and what I mean is that is that a is that a is that a real concern? Or is that a concern for Moscow as well as for for anywhere else? So to and, and I suppose you could ask the question about non proliferation, right? I mean. Does the harboring and the the encouraging of rogue actors in in the cybersecurity space is that is that something that uh, we should be worried about, or that Moscow or Washington is worried about? So, uh, is this all all coming from uh, the Kremlin, or to what extent uh, are people under con in control of everything that's going on? I don't know either one of you. I think it's a really good question. I don't think I know the answer to it. Certainly, it's not all coming straight from the Kremlin, right? If you look at sort of the technical attribution that we do on these types of attacks, you can trace the JBS attack or the Colonial Pipeline attack back to particular cybercrime groups that we believe are based in, or at least partly based in Russia, um, but are not actually sort of in the government the way that we can attribute the NotPetya attack to sort of being developed directly by Russian military. 
And so I think there's there's definitely a wide range of actors. We have some idea of the technical tools they use to stay on the good side of the Russian government, right? We know that there are uh, pieces written into their malware, pieces of code that actually prevent this malware from launching on most Russian computers that are running common Russian software so that it's not affecting Russian companies, Russian victims very much. We know that there's some intelligence sharing, we think, between some of the large cyber criminal organizations and the Russian government. I don't actually know sort of how easily or how quickly the Russian government could crack down on these groups if they wanted to. I, I don't have a good handle on that. I do think that if there's some kind of agreement reached, no matter sort of how broad or how vague about we're not going to target critical infrastructure anymore, that's going to be a really crucial piece because the Russian government has not itself directly targeted very much critical infrastructure. More of that has come from some of these groups that they seem to be harboring. And one thing to, to maybe add to that, Rachel, if I can jump in, is is that it's it's not only in the cybersphere where we are asking questions about who's calling the shots mm -hmm. or is actually ordering attacks. I looked, for example, at the attempted assassination of Alexei Navalny last summer. Um, you know, we don't know that it was the Russian president who ordered that. And we know it was someone high up in the security services, given the chemicals involved. Um, but I think there's a number of very worrisome incidents recently where it's not obvious that it was Putin himself ordering it. It could have been a small number of people around him as well. Uh, which is in some ways uh, substantially scarier. If in fact, there are more people in a uh, uncontrolled decision-making process uh, who are ordering attacks like this. So one follow-on question is from, from Mohammed uh, Namil uh, Benajah, which is, is Russia exporting its cyber capability to its allies, whether that be Belarus or Syria or Iran? Is there any evidence of that? I would say mostly not. Mostly you don't export cyber capabilities because you burn vulnerabilities once you share them and you can't necessarily use them yourself. The exception to that is really in the ransomware space where you see Russian organizations like the one that launched the Colonial Pipeline attack that operate what's called ransomware as a service. So you set up a sort of little criminal intermediary company where I rent out my ransomware programs to other people who want to launch ransomware attacks. And you could imagine that a little bit as sort of an, an exporting function for some of these criminal functions. But on the whole, we haven't seen a huge amount of sort of malware or vulnerability that we think was originally developed by Russia and not used by them first coming out of other countries. So there's, there's two really good questions which go to the heart of, I think, of the conversation around democracy in the U.S., but also in the EU. One, one question from uh, Zved. As in buyer is, the U.S. may take offensive cyber action while Russia can couple cyber action with disinformation. The U.S. cannot as a democratic country. Discuss. Does this make Russia play a stronger hand by default? So in, does, does democracy hold you back? Does the conversation around privacy um, and the sort of sh shifting norms around how we think about uh, the cyber age um, hold, hold the U.S. back when it would come to international action. Josephine. I don't know if I would say democracy holds you back. I think free speech protections hold you back in a lot of ways on the internet. And I don't say that to, to diminish their importance, but if you're thinking about, say, the kinds of disinformation campaigns that the Russian government launched during the 2016 election, Right. If the U.S. were a different country with different protections, it would be conceivable to have laws in place that say any platform, any person sharing any of that stolen information that was gotten illegally could be held accountable for that in some way. And that's not possible to do in a country with the First Amendment that we have. And so I think it's certainly the case that sort of free speech protections really change what you can do in the aftermath of a big breach or the theft of a lot of sensitive information in ways that you don't see if you look at China, if you look at other places that aren't constrained in that way. I think I would, I would add to that, Rachel, that and I, I agree completely. I, I think the one thing that I think our collective discussion of the past couple of years has overemphasized is the fragility of democracy. Uh, relative to the fragility of other systems. Um, because certainly mm -hmm. democracy is, is is fragile in all the ways we know, but so too are autocracies. And, and no one knows that better than the autocrats themselves who are 
uh, who are among the most nervous people in the world. That they uh, go to steps such as poisoning their opponents and, um, and and locking up opposition leaders with no hope of taking power. So I think it's 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 right to emphasize the constraints that our system imposes, but also important to emphasize the the challenges and the fragilities in, in other systems as well. So there's also a sort of question around uh, um, allies. Uh, uh, Nakib Nouri says the recent speculation and reports that the U.S. spied on allies in Europe, or if I was going to reframe Nakib's question, it would be that they got caught spying, <laughs> because it happens all the time, but uh, could also affect how much allies are willing to collaborate with the U.S. I mean, so... Uh, so perhaps the, the reply to that question, but also an additional question is, what is the strength of Five Eyes in this era of cybersecurity? Is, is that, uh, it's, it, it has its, uh, it gets buffeted, obviously, from other strategic questions, but uh, perhaps talk a little bit, both of you, about um, do these kinds of incidents affect the ability to cooperate? And then what is the strength of cooperation? So I do think that there's there's an impact on sort of how well the U.S. is able to cooperate with other countries based on going all the way back to the Snowden leaks, right, based on this sense that they are not always telling the truth with their allies, that there's a lot of stuff they're doing that they're pressuring other countries not to do. And I think if we were going to sort of try to place blame for why in the early 2010s the U.S. is so unable to make progress on cybersecurity norms, a lot of that comes back to the level of distrust that's engendered by those noted leaks and the revelations of how the United States is using cyber capabilities for espionage itself. Um, I don't know, this, is, this will be a very unpopular answer, at least with people in my world. If I were gonna say what I think the strength of the five eyes is when it comes to cyberspace, it's really, it's really the, the big tech companies. It's Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. It's the fact that those are all headquartered in the United States, that those all care a lot about not just the US government and what they do, but also the UK, also Australia. Those are other imported markets. And that those are platforms which have tremendous global reach. And so the question of sort of how those are regulated and what they have to do to stay in the good graces of the U.S. government in particular and the Five Eyes more broadly is of great interest to almost every other country in the world. And that's, that's where I see the greatest strength that the Five Eyes have right now. Chris, any other thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting to hear, hear Five Eyes invoked because it's not often invoked in conversations about Russia. The, the discourse on China is, is fixated mm -hmm. on Five Eyes as being an important uh, player, but in, in Russia, there's not much concern at all about Australia and New Zealand, as uh, you can probably imagine. So it's, it's, it's just the U.S. and U.K. that, that fixture in, in Russian thinking about, about cyber issues. So we have a uh, so we have some thank yous coming in, which is good. Uh, um, I think shared by everybody. Um, there's a question here in 2015, following the approval of the Russian national security strategy. Uh, is that strategy itself uh, to be seen as a threat to other nations in terms of cybersecurity? I don't know, Chris. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I don't know if it's intended to be seen as a threat per se. I mean, it's, it's clear that Russia wants other countries to know about its cyber capabilities. So in, in some sense, I guess that's, that's an implicit threat uh, insofar as any sort of offensive capability is an implicit threat that it might someday be used. Um, I, I don't think Russia self-identifies as being uh, more threatening than the average great power although we might disagree. I think Russia's self-perception is in, in fact that it's, it's the one being threatened by uh, American power uh, and, and, and it's trying to defend itself. And that's not to endorse that description, but I think that is certainly how most Russian leaders uh, see, um, see, see their, their place in the world. They see them as being hemmed in by the power of the United States and, and the U.S. allies, and, and all of their efforts are simply an attempt to, to, to keep up with other powers that are are more influential than they are. So we have a, we have two questions from from our colleague uh, Rocky Rock, uh, Professor White, who is of course our um, man on the Arctic and our marine uh, <coughs> program uh, lead. 
So uh, Rocky says that the Russian Coast Guard is currently doing an exercise with the Norwegian Coast Guard to practice search and rescue and other Coast Guard missions in the Arctic Ocean. How can the Biden administration build on the Arctic Coast Guard Forum uh, and North Pacific Coast Guard Forum to keep building trust um, uh, between NATO and Russia? Uh, and then he goes on to say, P.S. Secretary Blinken and uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov seem to have a constructive dialogue at last month's Arctic Council ministerial meeting. Do you think that uh, positive momentum can be maintained in the Arctic despite growing tensions over cyber attacks? Any reflections? This feels like a question that Rocky would be so much better able to answer than I <laughs> I, I know so little about the Arctic di diplomacy. I will say, I think to my mind, um, the deterioration on cybersecurity has not been a huge, has not been sort of the defining wedge between the US and Russia until very, very recently, if at all, that sort of that deterioration has happened in the context of broader deterioration of the relations between the two countries and my pretty limited window into it. And so it would only be sort of in the past year or two that I think cybersecurity would be a factor that would make the United States say, look, we don't, we don't wanna you know, negotiate or work with you on other things because of what's happening in cyberspace. I could imagine after the past year that that could start to be an issue and that it could come up in discussions around the Arctic or other issues where the US and Russia, NATO and Russia have been able to work more productively. I don't know if that's been the case yet though. Yeah, my, my sense, I agree. My sense is that the Arctic has always been, um, has always been an area where there's less disagreement between Russia and NATO. And so the Arctic Council discussions have always been substantially uh, more cordial than, than most uh, discussions between Russia and NATO members or Russia and the United States. So I don't know if there's that much scope for taking Arctic Council meetings and using that mm -hmm. to build a, a more functional relationship in general. It seems to me that some of the, the more high priority issues on both sides on the strategic stability front uh, on, on Ukraine and European security, security need to be addressed before you actually get an improvement in, in the relationship writ large. So Dennis Johnson asked the question, and going back to this point that, that you, you've made about you know, if there was to be sort of baby steps of some kind of framework of, uh, around this that, you know, could, could, either, could both sides forswear off attacking critical infrastructure, you know, what, what would the sort of beginning of that look like? And his question is, how would we differentiate between criminal or political cyber attacks and, and, and an attack which may be probing or preliminary to military action? The recent attacks on the U.S. energy and food systems are concerning in the choice of targets compared to an attack on a larger, richer company. Or, or, um, so um, some reflections on that, perhaps? It's always really hard to do in cyberspace to say sort of what exactly was the motivation here? Was this financial? Was this political? Um, it's a long conversation that the United States has been having with China for many years with very limited progress, I would say, on that front about the difference between economic espionage and political espionage. And I think in a lot of cases with cyber attacks, the answer is a sort of, you know, it when you see it, right? You, you say not Petra is politically motivated because you look at the dynamics between Ukraine and Russia at the time and you say this is something that feels like part of a larger geopolitical conflict, ditto between Russia and Estonia in 2007. You look at something like JBS or Colonial Pipeline and you say this seems financially motivated because there are millions of dollars going out the door in ransom payments or because of the groups that we're, we're attributing this to. But there often aren't very clean delineations. And because of that, I think the real answer to sort of what would an agreement have to look like would be that it's not just about sort of the Russian government agreeing not to attack critical infrastructure itself but also really being willing to cooperate and crack down on the groups within the country that are doing that as well. And without sort of both pieces, it's a very sort of weak or meaningless agreement. Uh, well, so, so the next question that's come in is, um, I suppose this is to Chris, but for, to both of you, is to what extent is there a risk uh, of a cyber competition or cyber conflict um, touching off uh, a broader um, a broader armed conflict. Um, 
do you, do you consider that in terms of real risk or? Well, I think there's 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 an easy um, answer to that question, which is it's certainly possible to see a cyber attack as part of a broader escalatory spiral that leads you towards military conflict. Um, and, and one could argue that we've already seen a couple of cyber attacks, uh, including those that Josephine had mentioned, as part of the spiraling downwards of relations between Russia uh, and the West that have put us clo- you know, closer to military conflict in the past couple of years than at any point since the Cold War. So in, in that sense, I think we, we've already got evidence that uh, cyber attacks are pushing us closer to the limit. Um, I think it, it's also plausible to imagine cyber attacks that um, would would more directly spur both sides to military conflict. For, for one thing, it's, it's no guarantee that um, in any given cyber attack, the response will take place via cyber means or non-military means. Um, there, there certainly is discussion of, of whether you would, uh, in certain cases, use military means to, or, to retaliate against a cyber attack. Um, so that's, that's certainly one way where it could happen. I think also cyber attacks that target um, military or strategically significant uh, infrastructure could also in, invite that type of um, response as well. I don't know that we've seen um, that happen in the past, but I, I certainly wouldn't want to test it uh, and, and just hope that a, a cyber conflict would stay in cyberspace and, and not become a, a fully fledged military conflict. Sorry, sorry, Josephine, do you have any additional thoughts on that? I think that's right. I think it's, you know, the kind of thing where we've seen a lot of countries, a lot of groups, including NATO, make statements in the past five or six years saying we could respond to a cyber attack with physical force, right, sort of reserving the right to do that. Um, What would that look like? Maybe, as Chris alluded to earlier, sort of messing around with nuclear arms launch capabilities, maybe messing around with the electric grid. But it's not... I mean, to be honest, if, if you're looking at the United States sides of things, there's been such an unwillingness even to use cyber attacks in response to cyber attacks that it's a little hard for me to imagine that we would skip right over that stage and go straight to kinetic warfare. I, I'm less sort of in the psychology of the Russian government. I would say there again, there's been a lot of willingness to use cyber attacks to great effect. So I'm not sure I would anticipate much enthusiasm for going beyond that necessarily. But I suppose certainly all of these countries would want to make very clear that they would do so if they were driven to the point of feeling it was necessary. So in the last sort of remaining uh, uh, segment of the of this discussion, um, could you look into your crystal ball? Um, and I, I suppose the questions that come to mind are, We've seen a spate of recent attacks. We, we've described a situation where, the, where Russia is the rising power, um, which means that uh, domestically the, dis- the discussion has got to be, be defense, right? So we have to protect our critical infrastructure. We have to uh, invest in the capability to be able to um, uh, withstand this, this era of uh, cyber conflict. Uh, if it is going to be a chosen tool of, uh, of, uh, of attack by, by Russia or, or, or others that may be in the ascendancy as well. So if you look forward, what's the game plan for, on defense for the, for the next few years? And then is there uh, an offensive uh, plan? Um, we talked about uh, how this is nested with all of the other issues uh, between, uh, between Russia and the West or Russia and the United States. Perhaps talk in, just think sort of think forward for the rest of the decade. What what does the world look like when we get to sort of twenty twenty eight, twenty twenty nine? Uh, Josephine first, and then. Okay. Um, so I think I don't know if I can do twenty twenty eight, twenty twenty nine, but I think certainly if we think about the next couple years, sure. there's there's a clear sort of mandate now from the Biden administration towards defensive controls. And that's going to look like dividing up our networks a lot so that they're segmented so that it's harder to jump between them if you compromise one machine to then be able to spread that to all of the machines in the company or all of the partners machines. It's going to look like locking down a lot of the supply chain vendors so that there is much more oversight of where software and hardware is coming from over who's sort of 
touched or been involved in the process of developing that software and hardware, there's going to be a lot of probably fairly painful bureaucratic hoops to jump through in terms of being allowed to purchase new IT equipment for the government and probably also for parts of the critical infrastructure sector. There's going to be a lot of resistance to bringing new systems online and making them more connected for fear that that increases the vulnerability. I think that's sort of what the defensive landscape looks like. Where that lands us in 2028, 2029, I think is a really open question still because there are also an enormous number of countervailing pressures towards mm -hmm. getting the electric grid more online so that we can manipulate it more efficiently, getting smart cities up and running. And honestly, if I were placing money on sort of which of those was gonna have one out in the next 10 years, I think probably it's the, the smart grid, smart city push. Um, but, but I could be wrong. On the offensive side, I think you're gonna see um, probably some fairly empty agreement come out of this dis next set of discussions around targeting critical infrastructure that will, I don't know, at a guess last for six to 12 months before something else really devastating happens um, in cyberspace between these two countries. And then I think on the US side, you're probably gonna see some very tentative steps into offensive cyber capabilities. And by very tentative steps, I mean not targeting a pipeline, but something more akin to showing off the vulnerabilities we've stockpiled, flashing all the stoplights in Moscow, or you know something something that tries to send a signal of we can do this too, but stops short of actually trying to really disrupt critical infrastructure in a significant way. And whether that will have any impact, whether that will be meaningful, I think I don't know the answer to. Chris. But, and it is interesting, we have had the New York Times report, I think it was last year, that the U.S. had extensively hacked into the Russian electricity network, uh, things like that, which, um, you know, presuming the Russians read the New York Times, which I do presume, uh, didn't seem to have any effect on, on behavior. So um, maybe they don't trust the New York Times, I'm not sure. Um, but but I, I think I, I, I tend to agree with the direction of travel that, that Josephine has sketched out, both in, in the cybersphere, but also, I think, for U.S.-Russian relations, it's hard for me to envision any of the fundamental causes of, of the tension going away soon. I think the Biden administration is very clearly trying to turn down the temperature uh, in, in the relationship. Um, it has uh, imposed uh, far less uh, tough sanctions than people expected in its first round of sanctions earlier uh, this year. Uh, I think just today, or maybe yesterday, it missed a a congressionally mandated deadline for sanctions on chemical weapons usage, uh, which many presidents have previously missed, but uh, that they missed it is, is a notable uh, data point. Um, and if you look at the rhetoric after Belarus, uh, it, it, it read as after the, the, the plane was ordered to land in Belarus, it, it read to me like the administration was following the Europeans at a several days delay uh, and making sure to do nothing more than they have to do, uh, which I think was a very uh, a clearly uh, crafted signal to Moscow that they're not looking to raise tensions. And some of the question is, well, will this succeed in, in lowering tensions or, or will it be interpreted as, a, as an open door? And I, I think my, my read of, of the attitude in Moscow is that Moscow is willing to entertain the thesis that the Biden administration is going to offer meaningful concessions. Uh, but I think what the Biden administration is actually offering is a lowering of the temperature without concessions that will be seen as meaningful in Moscow, concessions on Ukraine, a fundamentally important issue for Russia, uh, concessions on European security writ large, meaningful concessions on, uh, on, on, on military force placements in, in Europe, especially in the nuclear sphere. Uh, and, and so I think that the, the hope of resetting the, the atmosphere around, um, around the US-Russia relationship without actually offering concessions is, is going to end up uh, disappointing both the Biden administration and, and the Russians. There, there is a strategy one can envision of actually offering concessions, which is what Trump wanted to do and, and failed to do. I think that that would improve the relationship at the cost of the concessions, which would be substantial. Um, but I, I worry that the strategy of just trying to make things feel better um, without actually changing any of the underlying dynamics uh, isn't actually going to, to improve things and it might actually make things worse in, in the long run. And so I'm actually kind of cautious about the administration's approach thus far. Uh, I, I certainly sympathize with their goal of improving relations, but I, I, I wonder whether uh, the, the current strategy is the best way to accomplish it.
So we have a great question that follows on uh, follows on in some ways uh, from from Lee Clancy, who's who's been active in the Q and A session, uh, and this is this really speaks to the role of the private sector. I mean, you talked, Josephine, about the fact that you know domiciled in the West are these huge gargantuan uh, technology companies, uh, but beyond beyond them more generally, what is the role of the private sector in I don't know how to characterize this, but you know, either in, in, in maintaining the peace or in, in managing uh, the cyber world so that conflict is not its uh, uppermost dynamic. Uh, what, what, what are the, what's the role that the private sector should be playing, could be playing in terms of it, you know, ca- capability, but then also compliance with controls, et cetera? So I think the role that the private sector should be playing is a primarily technical one, right? I would like to see them really take the lead on hardening their networks, thinking about network segmentation, thinking about sort of containment and mitigation of attacks as they begin. Um, and, and many companies have done some of that and more and more are, are thinking about it as they see some of these high profile attacks in the news. I think one of the newer things coming out of the private sector, which is a little bit harder to know how to parse, is that we have companies that are kind of taking a diplomatic role. And the one that's the the most obvious example of this is Microsoft, which has sort of put forward its own plan for for cyber diplomacy and peace and tried to bring governments to the table around this set of norms. And I think there's something both really interesting about that and maybe a little bit scary about that, that sort of it's gotten to the point where private companies view their own role as taking over from these failed normous development efforts in cyberspace. I'm not hugely hopeful about them. I think that sort of the the ability of private companies to bring governments to the table in a way that doesn't make those governments feel incredibly resentful and um, like they, they've stepped into a sort of proxy for the US government is somewhat limited. But I, I would mostly like to see sort of real leadership on the technical defense side and not anything coming out of sort of private sector companies around offensive capabilities or even around necessarily leading diplomatic efforts. Do you have any additional thoughts, Chris? No, I think nothing beyond what Josephine's already said on that question. So it's, it's, it, it is interesting because in, in many other areas, we, we talk more and more about hybrid governance, right? That the, the, the private sector is coming together with, you know, solution capability, but then also asking for norms and rules and guardrails to be set and then getting involved in the setting of those guardrails and things like that. So I think we, we are at an interesting point where um, that has clear limitations um, and some clear moral hazards uh, in, in, in areas as well. So I think... Uh, It'll be interesting to see how uh, that plays out. And I just want to push you a little bit. So we've had a couple of questions about Europe and sort of the EU relationship, the US and then China. Is there any, uh, sorry, in Russia, is there, is there anything that we haven't explored in the last hour or so uh, about the dynamic between Brussels and, and Washington uh, on this? Or, or Brussels, NATO, Brussels, EU, uh, either way. Well, I'd be a little curious to ask Chris whether he sees sort of potential for Europe and Russia to work together to put some pressure on the United States to make concessions around use of cyber capabilities, which is something the United States has been pretty unwilling to do in any of these forums, even the ones that it's convened. Um, And it's certainly a, a shared interest, I would say, of many countries in the EU and Russia. I think it's, it's always hard to, to in, interpret, I think, European statements when they come to the U.S. and Russia. There's always a demand from the European public to push back against perceived American overreaches. But then you talk to the security services and the military and you find that they're you know, entirely focused on uh, other threats and, and quite like the intel they're getting from uh, U.S. intelligence agencies. So, so I, I tend to discount uh, European leaders' public rhetoric when it comes to trying to rein in American power. Uh, because it seems to me the track record is actually that they haven't done much of that uh, really at all. And, and within Europe, you've got even really some fundamental divides, especially on this issue, um, because once you get east of Germany, uh, you find that there's a, a whole lot of uh, distrust of, of some Western European countries for being too soft and uh, a complete openness to a, a more expansive uh, U.S. presence, uh, both on the ground, but also in cyberspace when it comes, comes to Russia. So I think 
you look at Eastern Europe, there's actually probably demand for the U.S. to be doing more than it's been doing, especially more than it probably will do under the Biden administration. Yeah, I was I was always struck by um, yeah you know, at the time that the sort of U.S. public discourse started to focus on the the degree of sort of manipulation of of information in the, in the run up to the 2016 election, etc. That colleagues in uh, in Eastern Europe in particular, were like, guys, this has been going on in our countries for so long. We have an intimate knowledge of how this works and a little shock at, at perhaps how, how naive uh, they, they saw the American uh, public discourse at that point. So we are coming uh, close up to time. I'm going to let both of you uh, a chance to say anything that you wish you'd said that you hadn't said or a key point to think for or even – key places to look for good commentary and information on, on this issue as we go forward. And then I'll hand back to Corey to, uh, to close us out. Um, so anything we, you wish you'd said uh, or anywhere thing we should look for or any place where we can get a uh, really good commentary. Um, it's a surprise question, but Josephine, you're, you're good. You can, uh, you can pinch it. First to you. I think the thing that sort of really hangs over me about the U.S. and Russia is the sense that the United States, to a fairly large extent, kind of set the terms of international cyber conflict for a decade in the early 2000s. And that was very, those were very much terms sort of set under the Obama administration about restraint and forbearance and very, very limited, very, very targeted operations like Stuxnet. And... What I wonder is whether sort of 10 years from now, 2028, 20, 2029, all of us are playing much more by Russia's rulebook in cyberspace. All of us sort of see some of these very disruptive high profile attacks as one of the, the things you do in the international environment. And if so, what that looks like and whether we're sort of able to develop any guardrails or any constraints to how that works or if things continue as they have so far in that domain, whether it actually ends up being as much of a free-for-all as it seems to be at the moment. Thank you. Chris? Well, it, it's interesting, uh, just to hear described Stuxnet as, as, as limited and targeted, which on the, on the one hand it is, on the other hand it is you know, the quintessential example of a strategically significant uh, cyber attack targeting uh, you know, Iran's nuclear weapons program, which from Iran's perspective is fundamental to its security. So, so in some ways, I, I, in some ways, you could argue actually that a lot of what we've seen since then has been sort of less fun, less targeting of a fundamental um, state interest, and I suppose that's what the Iranians and the Russians would 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 tell us in response. I think in terms of things to read, I, I always read with Josephine Wright, so I would uh, I would encourage the audience to to turn to her to to follow these issues. Um, but I guess taking away from our conversation and, and taking away from from Josephine's wrap of comments, it seems to me that if if we buy the thesis that we're headed towards a, a more competitive multipolar world order, which I, I think is, is the takeaway of, of, of the last couple of years of international politics. In some ways, the more competitive cyberspace, the more disruptive cyberspace is probably a, a natural, if not inevitable, result of that. Uh, maybe not fully inevitable, but at least something that, that shouldn't surprise us um, as, as we see uh, competition between big countries and, and many other spheres. Uh, it's, it's not that surprising to see it in in the cyber sphere as well. So that's not a, I don't think a comforting thought, but I think it does provide a bit of framing for, for why in fact we're, we're seeing this emerge right now. So uh, Professor uh, Josephine Wolf, Professor Chris Miller, thank you so much for joining uh, the Talawa Symposium today. As you can see, this is a story that's going to run and run, and we're really proud to be able to have scholars with such depth uh, and wisdom to be able to share and both really dynamic teachers able to impart all of this in an interdisciplinary way in the classroom. So thank you so much. Uh, I hand back to Corey to close us out. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dean Kite and, and Professors Miller and Wolf uh, for a great chat. And, and as Dean Kite said, a great example of how our faculty are uh, engaging with the real key, key issues in the world today. Um, there's a, a link in the chat to our uh, session tomorrow, which is on diplomacy and health, which should, should also be a great, great discussion. It's at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So hopefully uh, as many of you can make that as possible. Um, thank you all for coming, for all the questions, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>
Have a great day.